This podcast is brought to you by the Dunfield Retirement Residence, a casually elegant retirement community located at Young and Eglinton in the heart of Midtown Toronto. Customized living options complement your independent, active lifestyle. Learn more at thedunfield.com. This is Bonjour Chai, the What's the Deal with Zionism episode. I'm Avi Feingold, and I'm here with Phoebe Maltzbovi. We are your Frozen Chosen. On today's show, we talk about dissent. What does it mean in the context of the Israel-Gaza war? Have we reached a turning point in criticism of the Israeli government? Phoebe and I will unpack all of this and more coming right up. Phoebe, how's your shopping? Are you one of these people that does a lot of shopping in the month of December? Or do you specifically avoid as much as possible malls and any stores where you might hear songs about Rudolph and um, drummer boys, et cetera, et cetera? Well, if what you're asking is, was I in the Eaton Center at the very moment when the Zara became... Uh, I try to remember when it's a busy time in a mall so as to avoid going to a mall. And if I need something, ordering it online because yeah. um, it's a little terrifying. But we also have an early December birthday in my family, um, Ooh, one of my children. Okay. So there's a lot of um, November mall going. How about okay. you? Um, I try to avoid any sort of shopping aside from food shopping in the like month leading up to all of, you know, December and holidays and stuff like that, even the post Black Friday or Black Friday itself or whatever, anything that's like you said, that has a mob mentality about shopping in person, I, I have strong interest in avoiding. Um, this year, I find it difficult because there are so many things that need to be bought for the new home. Um, but I'm trying to avoid that by shopping at the most irregular hours and in the most irregular places. Um, so I don't have to deal with that. Um, I try to avoid malls at all costs, period. Um, because like, I mean, really, like, why buy retail? Like, <laughs> of course, like, but we were we were talking about malls, because malls apparently are the locus of uh, where the locus of protests have shifted. Is uh, is that true? Um, <laughs> what I have to ask you is, what does going to Zara have to do with Israel or Gaza? Zara, Gaza, does it just sound similar? I, I don't know. I, I, was Zara the place like I... Yeah, so I, the, okay. I know. So this, I have been following this news to some extent simply because this is the local mall where I live this, uh, the Eaton Center. I don't live right next to it or anything. I live closer actually to the Dufferin Mall, but that doesn't have as many stores. So the Eaton Center is like the big... Okay, yes. Uh, why? <laughs> so yes, the mall protests. Um, so I'm going to do a little backstory to this though, which is that this type of protest um, came on my radar first when there was, I guess, I, I don't remember if it even ended up happening or what, to what degree, some kind of big protest in New York at the Rockefeller Center Christmas tree ceremony, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember there being a lot of sort of backlash to this, like, yeah, that's really going to get support for the Palestinian cause, you know, disrupting a Christmas tree ceremony thing in Rockefeller Center. But when I saw this story, I thought like, on the one hand, you know, I want to be with the people who are like, oh, whatever. But then I'm thinking like, isn't it better to be like mad at people at doing stuff for Christmas than to be like specifically targeting Jews, targeting establishments considered Jewish um, and all of that. So, so there was an actual protest at Zara in the Eden Center? I believe so. But but and... so the yes, so this seems to be that what this is seems like an extension of that type of protest, like disrupting Christmas shopping, disrupting Christmas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. rather than going to a hummus restaurant whose owner didn't sufficiently denounce Israel and saying yeah. like, that that's... Look, yeah. as as far as protesting tactics, I, I see it as like, oh, great, it's effective. Go to the place where the most people are going to be. And maybe they actually sent scouts and said, hey, there's 500 people waiting in line at Zara. Let's go and protest at Zara as opposed to at, you know, Indigo, which is in the same mall or whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I have no idea why Zara. Um, I have no idea... I, I just think that, hey, you know, it makes sense to go and protest at malls now because that's where the people are. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Maybe they and, thought that yeah. Santa was a rabbi. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> well, I mean, he wears a hat. And who knows? And he, who knows what's beard, under? Who knows beard what's beard under that hat? I, I've been thinking about this a lot. Just um, somehow this afternoon, in terms of like when people say nobody's going to like these protests aren't effective. I see that a lot from people on a sort of pro-Israel side saying like, well, these protests, it's nobody's going to 
move over to that side. But I don't think that's actually true. I think it probably is winning people over. I think if you're literally trying to cross a bridge that's being blocked by a pro ceasefire protest, you're not going to be too sympathetic. But if you're just, but like, it, this is about getting a topic in the news, getting people who but, otherwise never heard of it to care about it. And I think it probably is effective. Now, the question is what is being asked. And like, like I feel like you want to argue more on the merits of the protest than like just saying it's not effective because you don't want it to be effective, if that makes sense. Yeah, I don't think the protests are generally designed to convince people of the rightness of whatever cause is there. I think it's much more centered in reminding the public that this is a story and this isn't going away and that this number of people believe in this project mm-hmm. enough. Mm-hmm. And in that sense, yes, it's been incredibly effective. And I think the nature of these protests is what causes um, Canada to go and vote in the way that they did. And, you know, the, the shift in yes. public opinion happens because people are looking around at the pulse of society and saying, hey, there are a lot of protests like this, even though there might be protests like that. Mm-hmm. Um, there is so much happening on this side. We have to pay attention to this. Well, I would even go further. And I would say that I do not think that if I weren't Jewish and were not following this already and was not somebody who'd been to Israel and was like aware of these topics, I don't think I would even see this as an issue on which there were two sides. If I were simply just like observing the world yeah. around me, seeing what signage is up. Yeah, and this is something I wrote about for my CJN column this week, but that the in my neighborhood of Toronto, you uniformly see pro-Palestinian signs and have this whole time. If you see that signage, if you see kafias, and again, this I'm not trying to say like somebody should or shouldn't wear a kafia, that's not what I mean, but if that's what you see, you see these signs, you see kafias, you see pro-Palestine protests, you see hanging from some people's windows, Palestinian flags where I live, you see, and mm-hmm. this is not an Arab or Muslim area at all. No, what what I would think is you would think this is like Ukraine. This is an issue on which people who are nice people in the West could have one possible side. Mm-hmm. And that's, yeah, that's the impression you would have. And I don't even see this as that it's about moving people who had any thought about Israel before in any way, it's assuming that there's just like, like Israel itself is almost like a race from the whole thing. It's just like, there is the Palestinian yeah, it cause. To, yeah. It's there, it's effective. The thing, it's not convincing people one way or another. I think the thing that is convincing people one way or another, and this is moving to the thing that I uh, really have been thinking about a lot and we want to spend more time talking about, um, was, for example, the uh, incident that happened over the terrible, terrible tragedy that happened la- over the weekend of these three uh hostages that managed to escape from their Hamas captors um, and were killed by the IDF in this like indiscriminate um, killing um, because they just thought that they were terrorists. Um, the protests over the weekend in Israel, uh, the slogan there was Akshav, right? That now was the time to like, to change our minds, to to have a ceasefire, that whatever it was happening before, now clearly the tide has turned, right? The um, people are perceiving what's going on as being really not the hyper focus, we got to get rid of the terrorists sort of actions that are going on in war. Um, and that what's happening is a more generalized, we have to take this land um, for ourselves and rid it of all bad actors, however that might be. Um, so are we at a point now, first of all, how does one deal with criticism of Israel? Um, is it reserved only for people that are anti-Zionist and oppose Zionism? Or are we at a point where one uh, is able to criticize Israel or the Israeli government in some way or another? If so, how does one do that? How have we shifted from saying that if you do that, you're automatically an anti-Zionist um, or what? Um, do you have any initial thoughts about this? I have that, Avi, what, what you just mentioned, a lot, a lot of things there. Um, do I know how the IDF can avoid screwing up and what should be done now that it has in that particular way? No, there there I'm going to take a pass. I, I it's horrible. I do not have the answer. What I do want to talk about, though, is this question of the term Zionist. And on the wild off chance that anybody is listening to this and doesn't have fully formed views on this topic and isn't like sitting under, you know, all the many biographies of Theodore Herzl that I assume are in all of our homes. Um, but basically, I've been thinking about this, just like what, who is a Zionist? Because you see so much these days about Zionists, anti-Zionists, anti-Zionist organizing, people who are are or are not critical of Israel. What does this mean? And you see this in context, in, in the same sort of, in the same media environment as you see, like you're talking about, Avi, Israelis themselves 
including many Israeli Jews who are not happy with their own government. So there's this notion in certainly in North America that to be critical of Israel is the same as being an anti-Zionist, right? But obviously, if you're Israeli, you don't necessarily think that Israel itself is a, it should go away or should somehow completely redefine itself out of being a Jewish state, right? So I think there is something like a little bit, people kind of talking at cross purposes a bit. Um, I find the term Zionist very strange because it means wanting a, wanting an, a Jewish state to be put in Palestine. And this happened, whether or not somebody personally would have, somebody living in 2023 would have done that. It's there. So I just, I wonder about the term itself. Like, what does it mean when somebody says they are or are not a Zionist? Either way, I think it's just a little bit strange. So then if you just talk about, like, is there another nationalism that's like that? That's like saying you think something should be created? A hundred percent. So first of all, I mean, I don't have an answer for what Zionism means today. I actually was thinking about this in the context of a, that was listening to this uh, Haredi podcast uh, called Headlines, and they generally have halachic discussions about stuff. And um, they've lately been dealing a lot with this idea of Zionism because Orthodox Jews have, or ultra-Orthodox Jews, aside from religious Zionists, have really shied away from this idea of Zionism. And they've always been historically against the initial concept of Zionism or the way that Herzl had it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, And this rabbi clearly was trying to thread the line and sort of say, well, I'm not an anti-Zionist, right, the way that the Satmar Hasidim are, because they are following the footsteps of their rabbi. Um, But then again, I am not a follower of Herzl, because I thought that that project was wrong and flawed, because it was purely about a secular state and had nothing to do with religion, which I am, of which I am a part. Now, he had some of his history right, he had some of his history wrong. I'm not going to get into the fine points of that. But I thought what was interesting was the distinction that that uh, individual was trying to make about um, the difference between are you a Zion by when you say you're a Zionist in 2023, does it mean you believe in a Jewish state existing for Jews to go to continually, like now and not just having existed in 1948? Or are you a believer in the original Zionist project of Herzl and of the early wave of Zionists? And he's like, well, we reject that, but I love Israel as a country. Um, and he wasn't even mm-hmm. saying that as a religious Zionist. He was like, well, then we have to redefine what that is. And I think that that's Part of the problem is that there is this notion that as if you're a Zionist, you automatically believe in this project of like Herzl, which is, as you said, done. It exists now. And there are many people that are Zionists that, you know, may have a hard time with the idea of colonialism, but they say, but I'm here now. Right. I'm not going to leave. Right. Um, but, are, given, but are they Zionists? Or so I don't know. Again, I'm not going to go. Yeah, yeah. I don't know what that means. Well, All that, I know yeah. is that the thing that we have to get away from is this idea that Israel is tied up with this project of a bunch of, you know, Western Europeans going and saying we need to conquer or not even conquer. Right. We, there's this perception that it was about conquering or is it about a return to the homeland, whatever it's going to be. But like the reality now is that you're as being, as you said, a Zionist is a weird term simply because it's so far removed from the initial moments of it that we're just, we can just say I'm an, I'm a supporter of Israel. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, to and, me, and I, yes, that's, yes. that's, there's something there that we have to, you're right, that the, the term itself is led in, in the same way that we have moved away from anti-Semitism for a lot of people and say, well, we should just say Jew hatred, right? Maybe it's time to, you know, move away from this term Zionism and not, not replace the ideas, but replace the terminology so that people can go and say, listen, it has nothing to do with Zionism, it has nothing to do with colonialism. My cousin lives there. Where, where are they supposed to go? Yeah, right? I mean, and that's, that's the yes, question of what has yes. to happen. As to other nationalists, there's tons of other nationalist movements. That's right? not what the, I asked, though. I'm asking, are there nationalist movements whose name? Obviously, like, if you, like, are there countries? Quebecois. Quebecois. If you say you're Quebecois and you're a sovereignist that's, Quebecois, Yes, but right? there, you, but there isn't. No, but I'm saying the thing already happened with Zionism. There already is an independent state of Israel, right? Yeah. So I guess I'm saying that like Zionism is a term. That why is it that the term for this thing should happen is still used once this thing happens? So my argument about this, and this is what I, I blogged about it a couple of weeks ago, I guess, was something that basically like I don't think I, I think there's something inherently like people are always saying, is it? It's like, is anti-Zionism, anti-Semitism? I'm saying, no, no, no. The very discussing things about an existing state 
in the language of maybe this state should be put there or maybe it shouldn't. I think that's at the level at which there's a problem. Do you know what I mean? Like I'm saying people talk about Israel as if it's like, should it be put there or not, even though it's there. Yeah. So that's, yeah. that's, I guess, kind of what I was getting at. And yeah, I mean, I think the other question I wanted to talk about, though, is this um, sort of does being, and maybe this is like to get us away from the semantic aspects that are, I think, interesting, but yeah, like maybe get to something more concrete. Does being pro-Israel mean supporting Israeli military decisions always? And that so seems to the, be maybe more the heart of this. That's what the I wanted that to, I'm starting to yes. see turn. So yeah, what I ahead. wanted to ask about that specifically is like, is there a difference do you think between somebody saying that they support a ceasefire on October 8th and saying it on December 20th? Would that ring differently to you? So I, I think so. And I think that that's that Akshav moment that we saw over the weekend in Israel is basically people saying, look, I supported it. I thought that it was fundamental that we went in and we took care of what was going on. Um, but we it's two months in. We don't have all of the hostages back. Hostages are dying there by Hamas and by our own you know, hand. And 20,000 people are dead in Gaza. And yet nothing has changed at least, you know, the perception day to day. Um, so meaning, if you think about it, there was still a bombing by Hamas in Jerusalem, you know, very, you know, since the war has started. So like, are we more secure? I don't know. And I think that a lot of people are starting to ask the, the question. So two months in, right, that question, I think, is becoming valid for a lot of people um, to sort of say, you know, I'm a Zionist. Again, I support what's going on. I thought Israel was right in going in there. But what's happening here? And without even saying that I'm a military expert, which I'm not, and I know what Israel should do, it's easy to, and I think it's entirely valid to go and say, I don't know what the right thing to do is, but this very well looks like the wrong thing, which isn't necessarily my statement uh, on it, but is what a lot of people are saying. Um, although I think that I might, you know, have sympathies, in, you know, along those lines as well. I, I don't know what the military action is that can and should be done, but I know that whatever it is might not be this or should, could not, is possible that this might be the wrong thing to do. And I think that that's a valid thing to think about. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. I mean, the the other aspect of this I'm thinking about is just sort of polarization and teams on all of this and that it gets very difficult if you um, in a climate, both, I think, in the Jewish community and in the community at large, where there's this expectation that you have the team you're on on things, which makes it very difficult to just have kind of a normal, for lack of a better term, reaction, which is like, yes, Israel exists and has a right to defend itself. No, war should not go on indefinitely. It's bad when people are killed. You know what I mean? Like, and I feel like that's just the sort of commonsensical kind of reaction to things is very frowned upon because it's like, but either you're on one team or another. And if you couldn't possibly make a meme out of it, who cares? Yeah, the the what, what you seem to be getting and get at people is, yeah. outraged and angry, and that's what yeah. gets, especially in this new the new Twitter design where to sort of like monetize outrage. Like it's yeah, there are a lot of reasons for this or TikTok, whatever. Yeah, the, the I, I think what you seem to be getting at is the the perception that if you say that you want a ceasefire now for whatever reason, even without a negotiation, whatever it might be, if you want to ceasefire now, you automatically are signing up and you're a card carrying member of Hamas, and that you assume that you want the river to the sea to be Palestinian. And that's just not true. There are many people that are Zionist that are asking and saying that the, t the tide has shifted. Um, and yet I'm still a Zionist. I don't want mm -hmm. Hamas to be to be around. And that's it. So um, I was but, trying I mean, could to really, I, was just yeah, a question, though, please. on that front, though. I think the, that the reasons for that are complicated, and I don't think the blame can be placed, and this, though, is kind of a lead into my next question for you, but I don't know if the blame can be placed solely on sort of right-wing elements in the Jewish community, because you also have the, the rather obvious fact of at pro-Palestinian and pro-ceasefire protests, a lot of slogans and messaging that's very much like you're not, this isn't just Israel should sort of, I guess, chill out. It's more like Israel shouldn't exist at all. And, you know, you know what I'm well, saying? So I'm saying that I think the problem is yes. that there's a loss of nuance there. 
right? Their idea that if you're, if you're advocating for anything less than the current situation by Israel and the government and its policies and the IDF and all of that, then you're automatically on Palestine shall be free. Yes, but I'm saying there's a reason for that, which is that if you, what, what is the protest you could attend where you support <laughs> Israel's right to exist? No. Israel has what those is the protests, you could do? but but you yes. don't have those protests outside of Israel right now. Well, that's what I'm um, saying. So yeah. a good example of what's, um, and I really, I was trying to think critically about this, and I realized that a year ago, we had exactly the right experiment, right, to see how to apply these two things. And that was when we got to ju- judicial reform, mm-hmm. right? With the idea of judicial reform, there were protests that were put up by the Jewish community, members in the Jewish community, saying, this is not the right way for Israel to happen. This is, that mm-hmm. meaning what's going on. We criticize. We are Zionists. We love Israel. This is not the way that that the government should be run. And this is, you know, bad. And they, we want them to know both in Israel and outside Israel. Um, we want the government to know this is not in our name to borrow the uh, or an organization's uh, title. But like this, you know, that happened then. And that was mm-hmm. interesting to see, but we're not seeing that now. And I'm wondering if we will see that soon enough, if this keeps going, that you're going to start seeing Jews having that middle path and or people that are Zionist, uh, Jews or non-Jews, and having this middle path starting to have protests and saying, we, we are Zionist, we hate Hamas, this, isn't, this should not be happening. I mean, there is a letter that came out from, the, uh, un- uh, from about a thousand members of the Union for Reform Judaism, many alumni, uh, many current leaders within the community that actually asked exactly for that. Um, and that came just as the reform uh, movement was having their biennial convention. So I thought that that was interesting to see that this has started to actually happen, at least online, with people signing their names to such statements. But I think there's a chilling effect that happens when the major organizations have not yet said anything like this. And they're basically saying Israel needs to do this. There is no other way. We need to be having this war. We believe the IDF when they say that this is the way to do it. Um, And that you're basically saying if you don't agree with this, you're on the other side and that we don't want to create those polarizations. That is what I think needs to change. And I'm hoping it's changing with these with the the events most more recently. I mean, another thing I'm wondering about this is like, first of all, like I'm wondering like what the sort of public opinion is in Israel. Is it still backing the war effort or not? Because I think that's very important. If if you consider yourself, you know, on the side of Israeli democracy, if Israel is like, I could see if you're Israeli being like, you people outside of Israel have no idea what it's like. And that includes diaspora Jews. And it certainly includes not giving a crap about what the UN is saying. You know what I mean? Like I could kind of see... From that perspective, thinking like, and also just thinking like, um, let's say Israel does a ceasefire and is then attacked again, then what? What should Israel do then? Not to be all like, there was one on October 6th, but you know. um, Yeah, I I mean, I think. No, but no, Avi, listen to me. Well, I don't, I don't, I don't, (laughs) I'm sorry. I'm going to say it. There was. Avi, why is it a tired trope, though? Why is it a tired trope? Because that is what it means. That's what it means. It means what should Israel do? Because, you know, because I'll tell you, I, this is where I can easily side with um, an average citizen who was living in Gaza, right? On October 6th, right, Israelis were a lot more comfortable than they were on October 8th, for example, right? Nobody was thinking about these things. It was the middle of Sukkot. Things were peaceful. Things were happy and whatever it is. Um, But I kind of understand that on October 6th, it was kind of miserable in Gaza, regardless of what was going on just across the border. Gaza was still a miserable place, right? So for somebody in Israel to go and say, well, there was a ceasefire on October 6th, it didn't feel like that in Gaza. I'm sure of that. So is what you're saying then that, I'm not justifying it at all. Should, no, but I guess what I'm saying, but but I'm saying that I think to call it a, a tired trope. I mean, when as when I obviously you know it depends it how it's meant. But what I'm saying yeah. is, I think there is a genuine question of what should happen, and I think that's where I, I get I am stuck. with you. I you really, see what I'm, I'm with you. Like, I'm hundred percent with you on that. I don't know what should happen, and that's where, I just know yeah. that it doesn't work. It it doesn't do us any good to go to a people that that we're feeling right really tired and stuck living in a certain situation and they and just say, absolutely had to go rape Israeli women or else what well, again what I'm would, not talking what, about what, what else can you possibly do in that situation no again I see what you're saying I just, and I think I think the question is is there a non-military response that would work 
Yeah, I right? don't know. And, I think, and that's why I'm, I'm yes, trying to very hard yes. not to say what Israel should do. But I, yes. I'm trying hard to yes. say, maybe this, is a, maybe this isn't what should be happening. That's all that I, we we're trying to get at. And, yeah. you know, and that's it. Um, and because this is a, the, the style of podcast, we have to make it seem like we're arguing, even though we basically agree. Um, yeah, I think um, <laughs> I'm just wondering about, yeah, just if you could talk a little bit more about um, this rift that may be developing between um, even right-wing North American Jews and the Jewish establishment, if you could just talk a little bit about that. I, I, look, I, I think that the, the rift is generational in, in, in the, at this point, the way that I see it or feel it, um, and I'm not an expert. Um, but I'll give you a good quote that I saw, again, about this was an article about this big uh, the reform biennial and reform is a good lens on which to see it because reform historically was right. Reform Jews in America historically are very dem- like vote Democrat are not really, you know, voting Republican or they're, they're So they're not seen as the right wing crazies. They are very much vo- focused on tikkun olam and on social justice and, and would be very much aligned in that. And yet historically they were always very Zionist and very pro Israel um, and working on that. And so, uh, you know, working in that space, uh, there was a professor at HUC, Hebrew Union College, who was quoted, and he said, Stephen Windmiller, and he said that there's a challenge amongst younger American Jews struggling with the conflicts that they have over a different set of values or perspectives in relation to humanitarian aid and a ceasefire, in contrast to older American Jews who have a deep tie to Israel's security and ability to protect and defend itself. Um, and what I would say is that the generational shift exists there, but also amongst um, the people who are you aligning yourself with the organizations that are more led in this older way of saying that, you know, Israel's is our deep tie to security and we have to defend ourselves? Or are you more aligned with an organization that is basically saying, no, our job is to be a light unto the nations and to heal the world and to make the world a better place? Um, and that that's where that shift and that rift seems to be happening because there are you know, and, and I would say that it is probably more amongst younger Jews than it is amongst older Jews that are essentially saying, listen, I, I want to be a Zionist, but I can't, I don't believe in my parents' Zionism, which is basically killing, you know, 20,000 people, right, in the name of Zionism. Um, and that that's what it seems to be, you know, happening. Um, in the immediate, in the immediate aftermath of the terrorist attack, um, there was solidarity with Israel was at, was pulled at 72%. And by the third week of the war, it was already down to 59%, right? So this actually, the war is actually having an effect on people. Um, and, you know, so that's, so the rift is happening. The rift, I think, is real. Um, I think the rift is generational. And I think the rift is scary to me because it's essentially telling a lot of Jews that they don't belong. And that really bothers me and it hurts me. Um, even if they are anti-Zionist, um, that that's a problem as well. Um, I, I don't know what to make of it beyond that. I, I don't know if you have any uh, any thoughts beyond that or not, but like, I, um, I think it's damaging. And I think that the rift is real and it exists. I mean, I think it just speaks to the big range of views and the, all these sort of specificities that seem fair, that you can take for granted if it's worlds you know and that are, seem very strange if you just were like reading about them. I mean, I just think about like what, what when, you were, when you were talking about all this, it was making me think of somebody like Bernie Sanders or rather specifically mm-hmm. Bernie Sanders, not just somebody like Bernie Sanders, who sort of shocks a lot of his supporters that he's not anti-Zionist. Now, he's extremely critical of Israel's actions in this war, but he's not critical of the state of Israel existing. And for a lot of his supporters, why why would Bernie be like that? But it, to me, this just seems like, of course, Bernie would be like that. Of course, that would be his constellation of views. And that doesn't seem strange at all to me. Um, I should say that I have, have a similar constellation of views to Bernie Sanders, so I don't find this either strange or concerning. But yeah, um, anyway, I, think that, I, I, I just think what it is, I, I came out as a Bernie bro there. on the podcast. I think what but, you're hitting on yeah. is that there are fewer and fewer acceptable constellations and that mm-hmm, exactly at, at this point exactly. in time, the idea is, is that whatever it is that you believe, if you believe Israel has a right to exist, you're automatically perceived to be you know, in one constellation of values, even if you believe everything else, right, on the more progressive side of things. And 
I, I don't think that's true anymore. And I, I'm, I really wish that we broke apart these constellations and started looking at them as individual ideas, um, because it's just not fair. You know, when you don't get more establishment figure than Natan Sharansky, he was the head of the Jewish agency, really considered, you know, a, a leader, a, a, a global Jewish leader. And he writes this article in Tablet. I don't know if you read this, Our False Partners, Progressives Who Divide the World into Oppressors and the Oppressed Are Not Our Allies. Like I didn't see that, and I don't think that I would have a visceral disagreement with that headline that you seem to have. I think that there are many Jews that are young Jews who align themselves with the idea of oppressor and oppressed. And if you're going and telling them you have no right to think like this because you are on the wrong side of history, it's a little too jarring to people who Mm -hmm. have aligned their entire existence as saying, I'm Jewish, I'm progressive, I believe in you know, uplifting people that are oppressed. And Natan Sharansky goes and tells you, you know what, those people that you are with that are helping all the other causes that are right and just causes. Are they? Are they all? So Avi, this is where I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to be culturally to your left, politically to your right, because I basically, um, I literally wrote a book in 2017, basically arguing this, (laughs) shame is about that you shouldn't divide the world into a press oppressed or unoppressed, but maybe, I don't know, I have not read this specific article, so I can't tell you whether I agree with its contents or not, and a lot of people write things like this where I think it's it's BS, but this idea, though, that if you divide the world between the privileged and the marginalized and all of this, you get into a really difficult situation when you have groups of people who do not fit neatly into these categories mm-hmm. in all contexts. Mm-hmm. So I do think that the way that the current sort of social justice oriented left in North America divides things does make it so the Jews are the privileged oppressor. And Mm -hmm. I, and that that, what I'm saying is that I, I see a headline like that. And that is the point I would assume would be in that article. I would not assume that this is saying that you shouldn't care about oppressed people. That's not what I would take from that headline. I, again, like I, this is the first I'm hearing of this article, so I I can't say I've already read it. He is relatively nuanced. He is, he is somewhat more nuanced than just that headline has. Okay. But I mean, I don't even think that's a bad headline, but yeah. Let's take a college student who, when they were in high school, they, they were part of the gay straight alliance in school. They they really believed in helping other people. They were taught by their congregation that tikkun olam is is important, and we have to go help homeless people, and we have to help you know um, we have to go march at the pride parade. This is all part of being Jewish. And when you go and you say um, that whatever progressives who divide the world into oppressors and the oppressed, which by and large are the vast majority of people that call themselves progressive these days are not our allies. You're basically asking people to ab- abandon progressivism. And and I think that the better way to attack, to approach an article like this is to go and say, you know, there are ways of being, of helping the world without the binary of oppressed and oppressor. And that it's time to move beyond that without saying these people are not our allies. Because these people are not our allies is a call for saying, walk away from that and come join the right. Yeah, I right? see what we you're saying. I mean, own. this is compl- I mean, this is complicated, right? Like I think I wouldn't so easily buy into the idea that the people who are for helping others are the people who sign up for all the progressive causes. And I do I do think you could say that a certain part of the whatever social justice oriented left is not allies with Jews at this point in time. I I think that would be fair to say. I I would not have any disagreement with that. I don't think that it means abandon. It doesn't mean like, and screw the homeless. I don't think it means that. I don't think that makes any (laughs) sense. I I think what it means, I think, and I think this might be where we agree, is that I think it's an argument against not just this neat division between oppressor and oppressed, but also against having to have this sort of constellation of causes, because this is something that I've noticed a lot, especially lately, is this idea that what you think about Israel has to align with what you think about COVID precautions, which in 2023, which, you know, I have mentioned this. And and the reason (laughs) I mention it again, though, um, is not to bore everybody, but because I really do think this matters that you should be able to just feel that you can evaluate each issue on its own merits and not have to sign up for some sort of broader set of stances. I I, I could not agree more. And it's about exactly what I said before, that these constellations of acceptable beliefs Mm -hmm. are really like sorting themselves out into fewer and fewer available options. Mm -hmm. Um, And and that it's it's incredibly problematic because 
you know, there are people who believe X uh, uh, on abortion and believe Y on Israel, and yet you're being told that you have to believe these things at the same time. Mm-hmm. Um, and and I don't like that. I, I There's got to be a way to have more direct representation of various positions um, when it comes to democracy. And d- direct democracy is not a good idea, but there's got to be a way to create better sorting than saying, are you either, you know, liberal or are you conservative or are you an NDP person? Um, and whatever you believe in that is exactly what mm-hmm. is meant by whatever those things are. And it's damaging to the Jewish community, I think, in a big way, because mm-hmm. um, where, um, and I've said this in the you know, I definitely have said this in the past, um, where I see the establishment, the quote unquote government of the Jewish community, right, the the establishment organizations, mm-hmm. where their positions are, is increasingly out of line with a lot of people within the Jewish community itself. Um, and that that's where the, 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 the rift is going to happen and where I think we have to have my hope, really, really, my, my hope is that what's happening with this war with the past month or so, and Hopefully not. Hopefully there's a ceasefire. Hopefully there's something that it causes really something just and lasting. But in the event that that this keeps going, that the two things that will happen is that one, um, people are able to see, as you say, the genuine hypocrisy of the oppressor oppressed idea without letting go of progressive ideas. Um, and at the same time, hopefully all of this is going to re- reevaluate uh, what it means when one says, I am a Zionist. I had a question for you, though, um, about uh, October 7th and sort of like the longer lens of uh, Jewish history, because this is something I've been thinking about in terms of like, we talk sometimes on the program about the Dreyfus affair, right? It comes up here and there, Um, you know, Alfred Dreyfus, French Jewish army officer wrongfully convicted of treason and then ultimately uh, exonerated. In the late 19th, early 20th century, this is famously what Theodor Herzl, you know, saw the Dreyfus trial and that supposedly, although historians quibble with this, started modern political Zionism, right? So anyway, what I wanted to ask you, Avi, is about was October 7th kind of like the Dreyfus affair? And I don't mean just like that day specifically, but like was, are we in a Dreyfus type moment insofar as there's this humongous awareness of anti-Semitism to the point that I was, okay, so I was on the subway earlier um, with my family going to the uh, children's dentist appointments. Okay, so I was not in some kind of rarefied situation, nor was I in any sort of Jewish specific situation. This was just some big subway station. I don't remember which one. And um, the screen is up in the Toronto subway with like news, you know, like the ticker or whatever. And it was about Justin Trudeau being horrified at anti-Semitism, right? This is just like so, so central, right? So what I'm wondering is, is this a moment when a lot of people who had not felt particularly Jewish on October 6th in, for example, Canada, um, are feeling more Jewish? And yes or no? And if so, what does it mean? Or conversely, are two days ex- attention spans too short for this to have any relevance? I, I will because quote, in the 19th uh, century they didn't have they didn't have TikTok. Um, I I think that we will only really be able to understand this moment and the context in Zionism in 50 years from now, maybe. Well, I'm not talking um, about Zionism. The, I was trying the, to pivot this, away this from the change, topic. Or of what I'm Zionism. saying, the, yes, the, is yes. this a Dreyfus moment when people yes. feel more Jewish? Again, too early to say. Um, I don't know if it's a five minute moment. I know that in the weeks in the in the initial weeks leading uh, past October 7th. I, I did see, for example, people coming to synagogue more often and saying, yes, I need to do this. Um, is it an effect that has been lasting? I don't think so. Um, do I think that um, is this going to raise a new awareness of Judaism and Zionism, et cetera, et cetera? I think it's really too early because we're in a week by week situation. You know, if this leads to, you know, something next week that totally, you know, puts the past two months in context, you know, it'll be one thing. And if it's, uh, and people will always remember this, right? If, if, uh, if it goes in the other direction, and this becomes a long protracted war, where even more people die, I think the exact opposite effect is going to have, I think that we are going to start losing more and more and more people who are going to say not in my name, and this is not the Zionism that I believe in. And that's going to totally well, reshift that that their Judaism Jewish. about that. It depends on how you connect, right? Your Judaism and your Zionism, right? The, mm-hmm. 
again, I mean, there's I a third thing are... called Jewishness, which is not Judaism or Zionism. Yes. And so that's the aspect of this that I find. That's where I have to ask you, yes. Yes. right? I think that there are people that equate Judaism and Zionism, and that that is their religious expression of their Jewishness is by being Zionist. Um, I think that why is 100%... it? Why do you say religious? And as versus that, that is how they express being Jewish. Why because do you say religious? I, cause, cause I is think it like that, politics as a religion, that kind of yes, thing? Yes, exactly. Okay. The idea that like okay. this is how I practice my okay. Judaism I is I buy Israel, Israeli products and I read the Israeli newspaper the way that one would pray in the morning and I do this, right? It's your, your religious... Uh, expression, the way in which one would have rituals, one which would have customs, and one would have mm. various things, that gets supplanted by Zionism uh, in a lot of you know people's lives. And I'm not making a value statement about it, um, but that for a lot of people is there, and a hundred percent that has gone up. Um, there's Judaism that has gone up. I don't know. You tell me about Jewishness. And by that, you I mean, mean clearly yeah. so like I would, a secular Jewishness. Yeah, I would dance. say, uh, well, well, first, just to your point about... Um, people making Zionism their religion. I think there are people who are like it, to return to this whole thing of progressivism. I think there are people who believe in a bunch of progressive causes. And then there are the people who are doing sort of like witch hunts on social media, asking somebody why they liked the tweet in 2014 of somebody. Uh, don't they know that that birth is problematic? I think that there are people who turn politics into religion. And then there are people who just have politics and I think you get both with Zionism as with anything else. But I would say in terms of this Jewishness aspect, what I'm talking about, and this is very hard to measure, is just like how, because it could manifest itself in all different ways, and they wouldn't necessarily involve a synagogue. They might, but they might not. Um, it could be like choosing to do your swim classes at the JCC rather than somewhere, somewhere else. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. So sure. that would be an example of like, feeling more connected to being Jewish without necessarily fundamentally having different religious views yeah. than you did. So I think that that's where, for me, like this idea of Jews as a people really enters into it, this idea of like, how much do you feel connected to the Jewish people? And I think when I do think about Herzl and the Dreyfus Affair and all of this, yeah, it's right. that's true. He didn't see the Dreyfus Affair and come away from that, and or the Dreyfus trial specifically, um, and come away from that thinking, my goodness, I'm going to become Hasidic now. He thought, like, like this, it made Jewish peoplehood more central, at least per the myth. Again, like historians quibble with whether this was actually the catalyst or whether he just sort of retroactively said that. But the point is that that's the idea. And I guess I'm wondering whether... Like, my impression is that this is going to be a moment that, like, just from... And my impression based not just on, like, I'm not just talking about myself. I'm also not... I haven't done, like, a survey. I'm talking about just, you know, in my orbit, whenever I talk to somebody who's Jewish, just sort of casually, what it seems like, I think people are very conscious of being Jewish right now in a way that maybe they weren't on October 6th, in a way that makes... Uh, like anti-Semitism can make Jewishness stronger in complicated ways. It, it doesn't only lead to the sort of like hiding one's Jewishness or conversely, the sort of like really like draping yourself in whatever mm -hmm. logos or yeah, Israeli yeah. flag. I get it. Yeah. Um, I, I, I think you're right. I think it's it's really interesting to see how it is progressing. I think we should keep our pulse on that and sort of, you know, I'd love to see how that works because I'm skeptical about the Judaism, right? I think that the people that feel all of a sudden more like wanting to go to, to synagogue and wanting to do something Jewish but not cultural, meaning having with some religious content, content or going to Israel um, and, and, you know, being part of what's going on. Um, I think that that's here now, and I don't know how long it's going to last. I'm curious whether, you know, a good example of that was the, um, right in 1948, people felt much more Jewish. And in 1967, right, think about the boost in Judaism when, you know, that happens and Exodus comes out and there's all of, you know, all of this Jew Jewish culture comes up and there's this pride in doing that. Um, are we in that moment? We'll have to see. Let's, um, let's, let's take a pulse of what the uh, Hallmark Christmas and Hanukkah movies are next year um, to, uh, to get a sense of where we are in this moment now. I do not think that I, I have ever been aware of these movies like 
beyond having seen that there are think pieces about them. So there, I will are, have there, to. There are episodes of Bonjour Kai that you have to go back and listen to and, and take it from there. Oh boy. Sounds like I have some homework. <laughs> All right. On that note, um, tell us what you think. Where Are we in a crisis point? Are we in a a shift in the culture, um, what's going on, what's not, email us bonjour at the cjn.ca. We really would love to oh. hear what you say. The Substack has been coming out. Have we, we've been getting more subscribers. We put links to fun stuff and I write blurbs every once in a while about what's on my mind. And you've been writing stuff, Phoebe. So uh, check out the Substack. Are you in the market for a new watch or a special piece of jewelry? Are you looking for the perfect engagement ring to pop the question? Atelier Lou has all this and more. Eric and the team at Atelier Lou can craft a piece for you, or you can select from some of the exclusive designers that they offer. From a simple bangle to a statement necklace, Atelier Lou can make you or your loved ones sparkle. Located in the heart of Westmount in Montreal or online at atelierlou.com, visit Atelier Lou for your next watch or jewelry purchase. And when you do, make sure to use promo code BON18 for 10% off your next purchase. That's atelierlou.com. Let's move on to Nachas. Sounds Phoebe, good. Phoebe, what's your Nachas? My Nachas this week, um, Avi kind of nudged me into it, but why not? Why not? Because So I'm going to do two Nachases because I'm going to do what I was going to do, and then I'll, I'll do this one also. Um, I was going to do menorah wax because um, so the best thing my children got for Hanukkah was not any of the many presents they got. It was, in fact, so some wax was chipping off the menorah like I was in these big clumps before I was really cleaning it. And... Um, my older daughter seemed interested and was like, can I have that? I was like, sure, why not? And both of my children found this menorah wax, like the sort of congealed, whatever, like uh, solidified pieces of wax, the absolute most fun toy ever. They had such a good time playing with this and devised all these different games involving the menorah wax. Who knew this is like the coolest substance if you're a little child? Word to the wise, if you care about what your home looks like, there will be little pieces of wax everywhere if you allow this, mm -hmm. but it was a lot of fun. So that's yeah. um, one if recommendation. If I ever have a record label, I'm calling it Menorah Wax Records. <laughs> you would have to, you would certainly, I would be very disappointed if you didn't. But then, so my, my more serious nachas, I guess, um, will be the Jerry Seinfeld um went to Israel to um, meet with a released hostage and their hostages' families. I'm not sure. Um, but basically, Jerry Seinfeld, who kind of represents the sort of New York cultural Jewishness that I come from. I do not know. For all I know, Jerry Seinfeld is a very observant religious Jew. I have no idea. Um, he is the Jewish Pope of Manhattan, I believe. No, is that his official title? Definitely, definitely. The thing I always find amazing is that he is not actually, like, I think he's only, like, part Ashkenazi. And I feel like he's always, like, Seinfeld is, like, the most Ashkenazi-coded thing. <laughs> and yet, you know, anyway, it's not brought up as part of, like, Jews of color discourse type thing. Even though it could be. Who knew? But, um, yeah, anyway, the point is Jerry Seinfeld not seemingly determining IDF policy, simply, you know, looking out for the hostages and their families, good for Jerry Seinfeld, um, and Jewish peoplehood, real sort of solidarity there. I thought he was there to record uh, his new season of his new show, um, Hostages in Hotels Getting Hummus. <laughs> <laughs> you had to do that, Avi, you didn't... <laughs> I had to. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, Avi, what have you got this week? Um, I'm just going to shout out uh, Christmas Eve. I know it's counterintuitive, um, but Christmas Eve has always loomed large. How about in are you going to Jewish imagination? Do you have, do you have fond <laughs> words for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ at this time, you, Avi? That, that Rabbi I Jesus, about? please. Okay. Okay. <laughs> no, I, I always find it fascinating that Christmas Eve has always been like a big central part of Jewish life, whether you like it or not. It's not just another night that goes by. I don't think many Jews think about Easter, Easter Sunday, what's happening on that day. But Christmas Eve is so Jewish, right? Historically, there was this concept, especially in Eastern Europe, right, of Nittelnacht, right? There was a spe Christmas Eve was the night that you weren't supposed to learn Torah, 
And mm. as a result, um, I you didn't have all know these this. legends of these rabbis who would play. That was the, 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 the one night a year that they would play chess or play mm. card, whatever it was. Uh, there was there's a legend of one rabbi who would, um, because he's not supposed to, you're not supposed to tear toilet paper on the Sabbath. So he would pre tear all of really? his toilet paper okay, on Christmas Avi, Eve. Avi, you were teaching me so much. <laughs> but in, in recent times, Christmas Eve uh, is either the classic, like, you know, Chinese Chinese food and a movie, because those are the only things that are open on, on mm-hmm. Christmas Eve. Um, and, and then there's the rise of the, like, the matzo balls. Do you know about this? I was at one once in New York. Oh, really? I, I went to the matzo ball uh, website this, you know, before we recorded. And all of a sudden, I realized that it's really like a thing still. Uh, it is the nation's number one holiday party. There this would have parties. been in like, I think I, w- I would have been there. This would have been 2006 or 2007. Exactly. And it's yeah. still happening, apparently. Okay. There are parties this year in Boca Raton, Boston, Los Angeles, Miami, New York, and Washington, D.C. Um, it is... Nothing in Toronto? Uh, apparently not, or Chicago. Does that mean what, we live in Moscow? Matzo ball deserts? We, yes, yes. We are bereft of matzo balls. Um, without having to go into whether I approve of the matzo balls or I think they're the best thing ever or the worst, I just see it as this long line of like how Christmas Eve is in the Jewish imagination. And we should be okay with that. And, you know, let's find something interesting to do as Jews because it's Christmas Eve and nothing else is happening instead of just saying, oh, I'll just see whatever's on TV. So the movie and, and the Chinese food, going to a matzo ball, playing chess, doing all this stuff, right? As long as you're not learning Torah, right? Find some way to say, this is a night that a big chunk of our world does something. Let's do something else. Um, So that's my nachas. I encourage everybody to go and do that. On Christmas Eve, the Gentiles gather round the Christmas tree. They stay at home and party with their Goyesha family. (laughs) They disappear one day each year and pass the eggnog round. But it's all right, because that's the night the Jews control the town. (laughs) Well, it happens every year on Christmas Eve. All the happy Christian people take their leave. Yeah, the streets are deserted and that's big news. It's Christmas time for the Jews. (laughs) We will be off for a little bit. We will see you guys in 2024. We appreciate your listening and follow us also on Substack, please. Thank you for listening to Bonjour Chai for the week ending December 23rd, Shabbat Parashat Vayigash. The show is produced and edited by Zach Kaufman. The executive producer for CJN Podcast is Michael Freeman. Our music is by So Called. We are a project of the Jewish Living Lab and are distributed by the CJN Podcast Network. You can listen to all our past episodes on our page at the cjn.ca slash bonjour, and you can subscribe to the podcast and automatically receive all episodes on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. We'd love it if you told a friend about Bonjour Chai. It is one of the best ways we get new listeners. And as always, please do email us with comments at bonjour at the cjn.ca. The Dunfield Retirement Residence offers customized living options to complement your independent, active lifestyle. Welcome home. Welcome to the Dunfield. Visit us at thedunfield.com to book a personal tour.